Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Tom. Y'all sound so happy and awake and enthusiastic this morning. We were kind of hoping for a snow day, but that didn't happen. So. Yeah, I hate to say it, but you and me both. <laughs> uh, I, I kept checking my email while I was coming to work to see if Dwayne had any snow, but if their school was closed. Are you there, Dwayne? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I assume you know we're near your microphone. We can't hear you very well. Yeah, I just, I'd walk into the room. Sorry, I'm a little bit low. Okay, no problem. We were just talking about you. <laughs> That's good. That way you're giving somebody else a rest. Yes. Oh, uh, we just talked about how we were a little bit, like, hoping y'all were close for snow so we could have the day off, even though we just got oh, done I with spring break. I would have told you. Yes. Oh, no, I know. Snow. It's snowing now, but it's not a lot, you know, maybe like a half inch, and I don't know what we're going to end up with. They're not calling. At first, they were calling for about six or seven inches, and then they've changed it to an inch, and I don't know. I just know my past experience with life, these April and March snows, they tend to miss them. And when they say an inch of snow in March, that's when we get those two foot snows. Yes. At least that's been my experience. Some of the biggest snows we had, we were only supposed to have gotten an inch or two. Yeah, that's pretty much been my experience too. Uh, so. So y'all have a good break? Yeah, how about yourself? Oh, I'm pretty good, pretty busy. And went by pretty I know, fast. I, worked, I guess you probably worked harder on break than you did at, when you go to work, huh? Yeah, pretty much. I know that's the case for my summers. Well, that's the I case keep, for me. Yeah. Uh, I keep, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, you know, my wife works me so hard in the summer, I'm like, I can't wait to come back to work so I don't have to work so hard. I know that honey do list gets long. Yes, it does. And then and then you have uh, uh you know what you gotta get done on the farm. Yep. And uh and dealing with all the things that break down. <laughs> that's right. And then they just don't understand some of that. Uh, yep. Uh, uh, I don't have your exam up on Blackboard yet, uh, so I will try to get that. I forgot, completely forgot to do that yesterday. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, so, but I will get that up there this week. All right. Keith is about to walk in the door in about 12 seconds. All right. Do you remember what chapter we're on? We're on chapter 10, right? Delegation and empowering employees. That sounds right. I believe so. I don't think we started it yet, did we? Yeah, I know we talked about supervisory power and talked a whole lot about the milligram experiment. And I think that's about where we uh, left no. off. I don't think we got too much into it. Yeah, I think we quit at Chapter 9. And I think I got Chapter 10 on this exam. So, uh, While we're waiting on Keith, He's uh, here. I do have, and Jasmine, I did not check uh i don't did you did you email me that decision scorecard yesterday again yes again. Okay. Yeah. okay all right i haven't checked my email to know if i got it but i will get it graded so that so that just leaves you the offer letter and the rejection letter left to do right i believe so 
And the comp did you do the did you do the compensation? I can't remember what we talked about yesterday. I still have to do that one too. Okay, those three. Uh, I've got, and for you online students, everything you've got submitted, you know, I've got all your grades on Blackboard. So if there's something out there that's not showing a grade, I don't have it. So Aaron, uh, and and I'm not picking on you, uh, Aaron and Evan and the other online the online students, and the same goes for Keith and Jasmine. You can look at your your grade, your on the your grade center, and if it's blank, I do not have that assignment. Now, if you emailed it to me. I might not have gotten it because Jasmine had emailed me one and I didn't get it, so she had to resend it. So uh, everything you've sent me, I do have graded. Or everything I've received, I've got graded. Dwayne, I had emailed you the interview questions and everything week before last, I think. Okay. Uh, but I can resend it. I, I guess maybe it didn't. Something didn't go through. I guess. If I don't, I, I went through my emails. Uh, you know, and double checked everything over spring break and got everything graded. So evidently, I didn't get it. Okay, well, I'm going to go into my email and check. Yeah, if you can resend that to me. And that doesn't mean that you didn't send it. It just means I didn't get it. Uh, so, uh, if you could resend that to me, I would appreciate it. Okay, I will. And, uh, and I'll get that graded for you. And, uh, or I'll send it back for you to redo one of the two. So, any questions regarding the, 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 your assignments? You're about done with them. Keith and Jasmine, you've only got just, Keith only got two to do. Uh, Jasmine, you've got three to do. And so the next one is do is, oh, excuse me. The next one is do is acceptance rejection letters. Yeah, and if you just want to go ahead and do them and get them out of the way, you're more than welcome to. Okay. I'm I'm you pretty well I'm, pr I'm pretty well I'm pretty well versed in the rejection part. I don't know about the acceptance part. <laughs> well, just look at that grading rubric. Uh, yeah, you know, if y'all just want to go ahead and get those done and get them out of the way, that's fine with me. You know, if you've got, if you're one evening and you don't have anything to do and you say, I'm just going to do these and get them out of the way and get that monkey off my back, you're more than welcome to. Uh, so that's all right. So did everybody have a good spring break? It was nice and too short. Yeah. I agree. I had to work all week, so it was, I made a little extra money. Well, you and Jasmine worked all week. Tom and I worked all week. Uh, Keith, I don't know what you did. <laughs> You're retired. Uh, I guess you worked too, didn't you, there on your little place? I, I went to visit Noah's Ark. Oh, and yeah, that's your, right. I got that picture. If, if you uh, answered your questions, Go to uh, creationmuseum.com. They, they'll give you all those answers to your questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, was Keith was the only one that traveled over spring break this time. So that's cool. I've heard a lot about that, but I haven't, I haven't been there. Uh, but 
anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. That's in Kentucky. It's Williamson, Kentucky. It's, it's about 30 miles south of Cincinnati from uh, South Hill. It's probably about an eight-and-a-half-hour drive. All right. Okay. Uh, well, that was a nice little road, weekend trip for a few days trip. I did also go. Oh, I did also go. Oh, excuse me. Also, first part of the week, I went to the two-day Governor's Agriculture Trade Show. That was kind of interesting, and uh, I did get a a possible job offer if I wanted to become a council represent the Philippines uh, Agriculture uh, and for Virginia Commerce. It's not really impressive until I found out I had to live up in Washington D.C. and be a be a lobbyist at Capitol Hill. But there's a lot of opportunities in ag- agriculture for people who want to get into, I guess, be one of the middlemen, the brokers between uh, the various uh, com- com- countries representing the state and also representing the state uh, in those countries, too. It's, it's a very interesting conference. That's neat. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, do those jobs require you to live in the D.C. area? Well, the, the company, I, I happened to be having lunch at the table, and uh, the people were there, that they, they were uh, two uh, ambassadors from um, the Philippines, and they were uh, air culture attache, I think was the official title. And so they were here, I guess, promoting uh, Philippines goods to the United States. Then they're also buyers of, uh, uh, of a lot of Virginia agriculture products too so um you know it was just kind of interesting to tell about the job but you would be based in by the embassy which is in washington dc so um See, i used to work up the, the, and, uh, the problem is you know the trip that takes me five minutes here around south hill in northern virginia dc area would take you an hour or more and i just there's just too many people and uh, I, I don't know, it's just, it's just a very stressful place to live and a very expensive place to live. But the yeah. the, the other thing that was, uh, I think, interesting was, you know, when, it, when you look at the the dollar in agriculture, and this is probably a concern that really needs to be addressed. A consumer spends a dollar on a product, say Rice Krispies. Well, 50 cents of that dollar goes to Kellogg's, 40 cents of that dollar goes to compliance with the regulations, 8% of that money goes to, like, the middleman, the your uh, extension agent, all those people in between, and the farmer gets 2 cents on the dollar. And I, I was thinking that, you know, he could take his money, sell everything, put it in a safe treasury note, and I think... A treasury notes about two point almost three percent there and get out of bed at noon and making more money than getting up at six AM every day and and busting his butt. So I I think that's something that's gotta right, be really well, dressed. You know you know, this is uh one of Tom's classes he talks about that. Uh, and that's a good point you made, you know, what the farmers make compared to you know, the two cents and where's the, the rest of the 98 cents goes. You know, and the thing about it, you know, if you bought that directly from the farmer, what would you have to do to that rice to make Rice Krispies? Well, you probably spend a dollar to make 10 cents worth of Rice Krispies, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, so... That processing, you know, getting the hull off the rice and getting it cooked and puffed up and getting it packaged and paying for the advertising, you know, all that stuff costs money as well. So not to mention the transportation and the storage. So, uh... You know, all that, 
you know, all, there's money involved in all that. You know, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think the big take home was that, and I hope the current administration, the administration, there, there were so many different examples where, uh, the Obamacare, for example, a lot of uh, farmers, they can't comply with Obama by making their p payments for health insurance and stay a, as a viable business. And there are several other uh, EPA regulations they talked about, and mainly about if uh, if you have a puddle of water on your, on your farm, uh, that is considered possibly a, a wetlands, and the um, okay. Okay. Corps of Engineers yeah, can come in and regulate you. Now, I will tell you this. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, President Obama made an executive order and did away with that rule, the WOTUS, Waters of the U.S. That was uh, Trump. That was President Trump. Yeah, Trump. Not, yeah, yeah, Trump did away with yeah. that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Obama was pushing it. Uh, and, and I think, you know, well, Obama or not Obama, but Trump has said that uh, he's going to do away or do away with a lot of the EPA stuff. So, you know, I think, you know, if what he's done since he's been in office so far, he's trying to uphold his campaign promises. So I'm hoping he will continue to do, you know, continue to do those things. Uh, so if he strips funding or laxes those rules on the EPA uh, on the EP, EPA side of things I think that will help agriculture quite a bit along with other industries and, and the, uh, other, the other thing uh, too that needs to be addressed I think consumer education because in Europe a few states in the United States I think Vermont comes to mind they talked about is that um, they do not want any GMO products crossing their state line or country border. And if you look at what GMO, almost every product you have has been genetically modified. And people believe that if you eat GMO or the, you go on websites that you, know, you can get cancer, your kids get autism, all kinds of diseases and stuff by eating GMO products. And they gave an example of uh, a country in Africa where rice is riding on the docks because it's GMO and the African country government would not let the product in because uh, of being GMO and the people are starving. Well, you know, I agree with you. I think, you know, I think we need consumer education, not only with GMOs, but also with animal agriculture uh, and with the conservation efforts that farmers are putting into practice. Uh, I think consumer education is very important. I'm not going to dispute any of those three things you, you came up with. Uh, you know, it would be nice for the farmer to get more money for their product uh, as well. But, I shouldn't say but, you know, the thing with GMOs, there, there's, and with animal, or with agricultural, agriculture altogether, you know, we're two or three generations, or most, I guess we're probably about three generations, of people being removed from agriculture. They don't understand it. And you have these groups out here that give out misinformation or receive misinformation and they pass that along and some celebrity gets hold of it and then it just spreads like wildfire. Um, and GMOs is a prime example of that. You know, GMOs have been around for a long time. And, you know, there's no scientific evidence that there's it causes any harm to consumers. And there's a world of evidence that GMOs help the environment by reducing pesticide usage, uh, water usage, uh, and increase yields. So we're not going to feed the world without GMOs. Uh, 
So I think it's, uh, I think they're useful. Now, my wife is from Philadelphia. And she's got a lot of friends uh, that buy into this stuff. She's got family that buy into that. No GMOs and all organic and er vegan and everything else, okay? And one of her friends was telling me all this bad stuff about GMOs and how wrong I was and all this bunch of stuff. But she couldn't provide any scientific evidence. And I was just listening to her. And then I said, I looked at her and I said, do you like hard cheese? And she said, oh, yeah, I love cheese. I love hard cheese. You know, and that includes cheddar cheese. It's a hard cheese. And I said, well, you know, you were born in 77. You've eaten a lot of hard cheese. Has it hurt you? She went, no. And I said, well, are you going to continue to eat the cheese? She went, oh, yeah. I said, well, you need to do your research because this is made from GMOs. Let me tell you something. That did not go over very well with her. See, hard cheese... In order to make cheese, you have to have the enzyme renin, right? And renin naturally is in the mucosa lining of suckling calves. So back in the old days, they would kill those suckling calves, scrape the mucosa membrane out, strain it, Get that renin and make their cheeses. Well, they were wasting that calf meat. So from that, from the cheese industry, spawned the veal industry of eating veal, milk-fed calves. So they'd feed these calves milk, get them bigger, slaughter them, take the mucosa membrane out of the abomasum, extract the renin, make the cheeses, and sell the veal meat. You know, in the 70s, PETA started hitting the veal industry really hard. And these scientists saw that that was on, the writing on the wall, that the veal industry was going down. So they're going to have to do something to save the cheese industry. So they modified some bacteria to produce renin. And that's where renin is produced today, from GMO bacteria. And I can tell you, she did not like that story at all. <laughs> I don't think she likes me very much because uh, I don't see her way of politics and her when I educate her on on agriculture, it, it aggravates her. <laughs> she likes to have the last word. But yeah, uh, it, it, it's but, <laughs> That's something I, I didn't know. And another thing, speaking along education of the consumer, I, uh, fortunately, I've never been on food stamps or needed any type of government assistance in my life. But there was an article I was reading, that, and I'm not, I don't exactly how it's administrated, but, you know, when I, when I was a college student and we were first married, we budgeted our money and we, we shopped the sales and, you know, try to spread our dollars as much as you can. But you have people who are not doing that, who are on government assistance, and they're going the Whole Foods and, and going the organic route instead of paying 99 cents a pound for whole chickens. They're paying 4.99 cents a pound because they're getting organic chicken. Uh, you know, there's something that's wrong with that. I mean, you should, they should be stretching their dollars like the taxpayers have to, instead of trying to go and get the uh, T-bone steaks and the lobsters. I don't dis. So, uh, sounds like you had a, a, you learned a lot at that conference. Yeah, it was very interesting. It had workshops, different people to go into. And I would say the, um, the high point, of course, I was the old fart there. Uh, they had the uh, companies and the representatives. It was kind of a student exchange. I went to it. 
and mainly uh, you have a number of people graduating uh, from college, and uh, they were networking for future jobs and stuff. And I kind of wished I had something like that or knew such a thing when I was coming along, because that, that was really neat that you got to speak with the, talk to the ambassador from Ireland, Australia, Germany, um, uh, all, all the different stuff, and, and agriculture is, is the big thing, because uh, as they say, if you can't feed the people, you don't have world peace, and you'll have world, world, world War III possibly coming with hungry people. Yeah, or your government will be overthrown. Yeah, exactly. Uh, food security, you know, or people having enough to eat, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not about, you know, it, it makes governments unstable. Well, I, I forgot about that part. There was a, a day about food security, and I didn't real, realize how vulnerable we were uh, to uh, sabotage our food networks and, and stuff. But there was FBI agent was talking about a big case, and um, in Iowa, I forgot the name of the seed companies, Monsanto's, I think it was. They have all their testing fields out there. You never know that they're there, uh, and they're not labeling thing. But they have security wires and and fences and all that kind of stuff. And for a while, they were noticing Chinese people in the field, and. Uh, make a long story short, they were actually taking the hybrid seeds uh, back to China to grow and get the hybrid seed that the Monsanto spent years developing and stealing and then trying to sell those seeds on the, on the market. But they caught them. Yeah, you know, agriculture is very vast and fairly open, and there is a lot of potential uh, to do harm to our food system. And the person that caught him kind of put everything together because um, I guess they're interviewing uh, the people and I guess the agent, you know, not being a farmer, said, okay, okay. But the guy, when the agency came off a farm, he says, that's a bunch of malarkey. <laughs> and, said, and so he started putting two to two together and found out what they were doing. Huh. The alibi didn't wash, didn't add up. Interesting. Um. So guys, there's a lot of potential jobs out there, international jobs, so on. Uh, there's a guy here from this area that he was involved uh, with, uh, he worked for an individual who ended up, was, very, was involved with buying and selling cattle internationally. And uh, so this this guy he got you know got a job with him right after college, and um, he go all around the country in Canada and buy cattle and ship them over to Russia and and Europe. Uh, Russia at the time was trying to get their beef herd started, and so they were buying a lot of cattle from the United States and Canada. And his boss was brokering, was the guy doing this stuff. So, uh, so Ransom was going around the country and buying buying cattle and uh, to these specs, and then uh, quarantining them, and then heading over to Russia with those cattle and and stuff like that. He was he was uh, involved in that. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so there's a lot of potential jobs out there. Uh, it, you just got to, you know, not just look at what's around, you know, open your eyes. Uh, ag is a very, it's the largest industry in the United States. It's the largest industry in the state of Virginia. So a lot of potential jobs may not be able to live where you want to live, but, you know, you can find a job. So, and, also, uh, and also, some of what you were talking about a couple minutes ago, if you want to learn more, take Dwayne's biosecurity class offered in the fall. <laughs> Cheap advertising. Right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about 
how vulnerable the food system is from the producers all the way through. Uh, so anyway, let's get back to HR a minute. Uh, chapter 10 is uh, talks about empowering and delegation. So giving, giving employees more power and delegating tasks and more responsibility to the employees. And what, you know, when you're in, you know, doing, you know, farming or running a business or whatever, you know, the crux of management uh, is going to be decision making. You're always going to have to make decisions. Uh, and the bigger companies, you know, inside and out, both outside of agriculture, uh, most businesses, they're divided between those that think and those that that do. I mean, that may sound very simplistic, very mean, whatever. It's just the way it is. You have management making decisions, and you have the workers carrying out the decisions that they make. Uh, and the thing, you know, the I think sometimes people get overlooked, especially the workers, because, you know, they can really make some pretty good decisions. They're not, you know, people aren't dumb. Uh, or not all of them. Uh, and, you know, they're capable of making decisions. And if you can get some of your, you know, delegate authority out, it'll make your, your job a little bit easier and it will help your employees to grow and learn more skills uh, and it may make them happier uh, if they want that type of you know responsibility so it it's not easy to do uh, especially for people that like to be in control uh, and we know we know people that way. Uh, so you know you're going you know people have to give up some control when they're delegating out responsibility or decision making to other people. And the other thing that that the thing that's very crucial for this to be successful is communication and interpersonal skills. Those are the, that's the key for success to involve workers in decision making. Uh, and, you know, we're going to talk, we, you know, we'll talk a lot about communication and interpersonal skills. Uh, and these just not only carry on in your professional life, but also in your personal life. So, uh, but those two things, communication and interpersonal skills, are the key to success to involve workers in decision making. Now, how come, and I, and I, I talked about this a little bit just a minute, just a second ago, why is it that some supervisors have a tight rein on their employees, or management has a tight rein on their workers. I just told you one of them. They like the control. Fear. What's that? Fear. They're fear. usually what are. What type of fear? What are they scared of, Keith? They feel like some of them come in there, a gun, just like the uh, survival of the fittest. Uh, Someone's waiting to to uh, 
take their food from them. So they're, they're protective of their territory, protective of their job, uh, everything around them, and anybody is, any, is a threat to them, they try to uh, neutralize that threat. Right. Okay. Um, they're scared, you know, they start delegating out their, their, their job. Could be somebody out there that does it better than them. Um, that's a good one. Book didn't even talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> he ought to add it in there because you see that a lot. Uh, yes. And it's kind of funny. And I don't know. Things I've noticed. The people that like to be in control and have those control issues, it's like they're the ones that are so worried about their job. You see, do you see that go a lot hand in hand, Keith? And your very, very much so. And as a sign of insecurity, and uh, upper management is one of the first things they notice. Because believe it or not, in my side of business, the more people you passed up the food, the food chain to higher levels meant that you got recognized because you were you were supposed to train and uh, um, really promote the people and, and develop your people. I would say it was one of the criteria for getting promoted in my business, the number of people that you could promote and move them up into the next uh, uh, level of competency. Okay, that's cool. And, and for somebody... To do that, to train other people and, and move them up the chain, well, they have to be pretty confident, don't they? They can't feel threatened by those other workers. Yeah, because we worked independently, and basically you had to, to know the whole business, and so uh, they wanted you to get experience in all levels and all areas of the business. So uh, a lot of times when you're in negotiations and stuff and – you don't have somebody there in the room that you can turn around and say, hey, what do you think about this? You have to kind of know, okay, the whole game plan, you make the decision, what, what's going to be the ramification of your decisions on the whole corporate level? And that, that really aids you a lot. And uh, if you made the right decisions, you were rewarded very well. And if you made the wrong decisions, uh, you might be looking for a new job. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Thanks. Very interesting. Uh, and, you know, in that that type of situation where Keith was in, you don't see that, you know, I don't think that's very common, is it? Actually, I haven't seen a whole lot where they try to, you know, you sit there and train and move people up. It's like, it's what I've seen is, you know, I mean, that's ideal, you know, because you're bettering, you know, you're teaching the employees new skills and giving them a chance to grow and learn and increase their income, which is what workers want or good, you know, but I don't, well, I don't know how much that really happens. It goes on quite a bit, but you probably, you probably don't realize the game plan. Usually okay, a, per, a, a good a good manager, uh, he is thinking of his survival too, and he is he is climbing the corporate ladder to be promoted. And when he gets at that level uh, position, say a, a CFO or CEO, and a lot of times you'll hear or you'll, you'll pick up the paper, a Wall Street Journal or a business article, and watch it, you know, so and so reorganizes this and that, and so and so has, has resigned because he wants to spend more quality time with his family or whatever the reason may be. That person brings in his whole team. So all the people he's trained over the years in that, he's put them in strategical positions. So then he kind of makes his cabinet, and he's got the, the key people that's, that he can trust and depend upon help him run the company. And actually, when I used to work for, when I used to work for Conseco Finance and GE, in both cases, that was one of the things that they were pushing when they were evaluating managers is how many people were coming up through your department and moving up the ladder. Okay. Uh, all right. 
So it does happen more than I think, and that's probably because I've only just been in in the ag industry, uh, and mainly on farms or uh, in a teaching or educational type role. Um, so I haven't experienced that. So I, I misspoke. I apologize. Uh, it was so probably going on, mistake. but you weren't aware of it. I said it was probably going on, but you weren't aware of it. Maybe. Um, it it might have been, but most of these, you know, the farms I worked on, you know, it was a it was a a, a family owned deal. Yeah. Uh, now, when I was at Stewart's, you know, that's that's a corporation owned by stockholders. Uh, my manager, I, I think it, I think it went on there, but I think we also knew there was no room for advancement unless there was a death. Uh, because what happened, you know, Zan Stewart was the head honcho, and he reported to the stockholders, and then you had Robert Wampler who was a general manager, and then you had a farm manager. I was one of them for the Rich Mountain Farm, and then you had another farm manager for Clifton Farm, and Robert was kind of the farm manager for, for Rosedale for that for that section. So I came in as a, a manager there at Rich Mountain Farm, and we had – you know, we were talking about incentive pay. You know, Zan did have that established at at Stewart's. You know, we got a salary, and then we've got we got production bonuses. And the way that I don't uh, I don't remember all the details on it, uh, but if I reached certain quotas, I got a production bonus. And if I if I if I attain my production bonus, my manager Robert Wampler got a production bonus. So it was of his best interest to help me and the other the manager at Clifton reach our production bonuses because it helped him financially as well. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so we really had a good relationship. Uh, I knew he had my back, and he knew that I was going to be honest with him on everything going on because I wanted to reach my, you know, I wanted to do the best job I could. And, you know, of course I wanted extra money, and but I wanted to learn, and I wanted to grow, and I wanted to be the best I could be. And Robert saw that right off in me, I guess. And he really, you know, he really helped me. I could call him at 2 in the morning, and he would come over and help me pull a calf if I needed it. Uh, so, you know, I, I it, it was there. And now if, if anything had happened to Zan in that time, I don't know if the stockholders would have put Robert in Zan's position or not. And the only way I would have moved up the chain was if Robert left. Then maybe I could have gotten his job. But I was pretty much uh, stuck where I was uh, until somebody left or somebody died. Does that make sense? Marry the boss's daughter. What was that, Keith? I said he could have married the boss's daughter, but I guess you were married at that time. No, I wasn't married at that time. Uh, but the boss's daughter was already married. Oh, uh, okay. I don't think I would have gotten along too well with her. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, I have to make sacrifices to get ahead sometimes. 
You know, my boss told me one time, he said, now, Dwayne, I'm just going to give you a piece of advice. You can fall in love with a rich girl as easy as you can a poor girl. So marry rich. And, you know, I just came back from out west working with a bunch of cowboys. And you kind of get it, you know, you kind of get that cowboy attitude of, uh, you know, being very practical, but also speaking what's on your mind. And that was probably one time I should have kept my mouth shut. But I looked at him and I said, yeah, you may marry rich and be able to love her. But if you marry rich, you'll earn every penny you get. And he got mad and drove off. And then I found out later he married rich both times. <laughs> His first wife was pretty rich. And unfortunately, she was, everybody said she was such a real good lady. Uh, everybody loved her, all the old men there that worked on the farm. Uh, but she died of cancer, and, uh, and, and he remarried again. And this lady... She was she was different, but uh, but he didn't. I shouldn't have I shouldn't have made that comment. Because <laughs> that's kind of the cowboy way of thinking. You marry rich, you're going to earn every penny you get. <laughs> See, I got the philosophy: if you marry poor, no matter how bad things they. No matter how bad things get, they probably had it worse. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> enough of my philosophies on that. <laughs> uh, so, why, you know, back to your question, why do some people, supervisors have a tight rank? And, you know, you got that authority is satisfying to them. You have that fear of, some of them have that fear that uh, their workers could be better at it than they are, and they feel it's a sign of weakness. Um, and the other thing could be is that they have the, the attitude that workers do, don't make decisions well or they don't handle responsibility well. Uh, you know, and sometimes that may be the case. There was this one guy, uh, I can't think of his name, but Tom, you probably know him. You've, the guy that used to manage Weir Menangus. You know who I'm talking about? No. Well, I'm terrible with names. All right. You're familiar with Weir Menangus, though, right? Before, yeah. Before they sold out? <clears throat> yep. Oh, okay, Wareman Angus was a premier Angus seed stock producer, and they were up there, located up there in the Shenandoah Valley. Very famous uh, for the quality of cattle they produced for their registered cattle. And the guy that managed it, I only met him a couple times, but he was, he would not hire college graduates or people that knew more than him. He just wanted somebody that he told them what to do, they went and did it, and they didn't question it. So he tried to, you know, you know, he, I guess, he didn't like the having good quality workers and maybe had that idea that Workers just don't make decisions well or handle responsibility. I don't. I don't know, but that was the way he operated. But I do know this. Uh, there's just some people out there that can't make good decisions or handle responsibility. Now, you know, I don't know if they just don't know any better. Or if they were mentally challenged, I don't know. I mean, some I of think these a, guys. Oh, I was that? gonna say, 
I think a lot of it goes back to what Keith mentioned earlier. A lot of it comes back to insecurity. I used to work for a couple guys, and they were giving me a hard, doing construction work, and they were giving me a hard time because they're like, well, you got book smarts, not common sense. And all that stuff, and it's just, I think it's their insecurity and jealousy, knowing that they were, you know, lucky that their teachers didn't like them, so that's why they graduated high school. And then just, and they're, they're sitting there arguing with one another and not working and not doing things the right way, but but nobody else, they, they wouldn't accept advice from anybody else because yeah, it would go back to their insecurities. It very well could be. Uh and I'll tell you, sometimes common sense isn't that common. You know, it's stuff that you have to that. pick up. What's that? Oh, I was just saying amen to that. You know, what I would be, con what I would consider common sense in dealing with horses. You know, if you don't, if you don't know anything about horses, you have no clue. It wouldn't be common sense to you. Uh, or the same thing in, in construction or Keith's business or whatever. You know, it's just things that you pick up and you learn, and then you just think it's common sense that everybody ought to know it. But that's not always the case. So, uh, excuse me. I don't know, you know, you know, how much... You know, you know. Sometimes I think people get labeled that. You know, when they just they just don't know, they can learn it. But like this one guy, you know, he was a good guy. I really liked him, and he he was a worker there, at Stewart's, and he never complained. He would be there. You know, if you had to start work early or stay late. He was right there with you. He'd do whatever you asked. You couldn't beat him. But I think he, I think he might have been mentally challenged or something. I don't know. Um, you couldn't send him out to do something on his own if it was anything more complicated than cutting down cedar trees. Um, like, you know, we asked him to hang a gate one day, and he put the gate right on the ground, uh, and it wouldn't swing because it was resting on the ground, and he drilled in the gate stops uh, to where it would, the gate was right on the ground. Um, Might have worked if it was level ground. You just dealt with it a little bit, but, you know, we had to, raise it up a few inches, redeal, you know, take it off and redrill those holes. But, you know, he, he didn't know, but, you know, and if he was never been around agriculture, you know, you'd kind of say, okay, I understand that. But, you know, he was raised in agriculture, and that's all he'd ever did was work on farms. So I think there might, with him, might have been a disconnect. And I'm not knocking him or anything. I really liked him. He... You know, if I could just have, you know, he'd be a type of guy I would want working for me because he was dependable. You knew he'd always be there. And you could show him how to do something, and, and he would do it. And he would do it well. But you just couldn't ask him to go do something that whether or not he, you know, if you had any question on whether or not he understood. You couldn't tell him how to do it and send him out to do it. You would have to take him out there and and work with him and made sure he understood it and did it a few times and then you could leave him alone to go do do a simple task or what some people would consider simple task but he was just a good guy uh, I really liked him uh, but but some workers just don't have that ability is all I was getting at um, and sometimes the supervisors don't even give them a chance to figure out whether they have that ability or not. So it's just the mindset sometimes of the supervisors that they can't make decisions or handle that responsibility and 
they don't really know. Uh, so when we're thinking, you know, supervisors and workers, what's the different levels of involvement we have with our workers? Don't understand the question. Uh, I know. I, with the blank face you're giving me, I don't see Jasmine and Aaron there. The, there's different levels of involvement between management and the workers, okay? Uh, and they, how, on how, how much, when, and to what extent they involve the workers. So, you know, some management groups, all they do is just tell the workers what to do, right? They don't involve the workers at all. They just say, okay, here's what you're going to do. Get it done. You agree with that or not? Well, I think each task has a different level of uh, delegation and responsibility. Depends if you're putting a fence up, it's probably a very simple type of uh, procedure. But if you're, I know nothing about horses, but imagine if you're going to uh, train a horse, it's pretty involved and you, you want to be hands on and make sure that every, every step of the way that you're there, make sure they don't get kicked in the head by the horse. So uh, I think that's probably uh, depends upon what task you're trying to do. And then here again, in my past experience, most everything, I guess, is sitting down and explaining the game plan, what the purpose of what you're trying to accomplish that day, and then kind of let them, the employees, kind of decide who's best at this and, and who's better at that and, and sign the task according to ability. Okay. That's right. You know, you can do that. You can do that as well. Uh, you know, uh, and that's your, you're starting at doing that. You're getting those workers involved in decision making, delegating out. Uh, you know, even if it's something as simple as, you know, like you said, just going over what needs to be done that day. And they say, hey, you know, oh, Bob's here real good on the tractor and, and stuff. Let him go do that. And I'll go do this. And, James can go do this, or Ruby can go do that, you know. But, you know, so, you know, we're checking with them on that deal. We're, we're including them in that decision. And we're involving them, you know, what to get those tasks done. Uh, some people, some managers just tell them. They don't give them a choice, you know, hey. Go do this, you go do that, and Jane over here and go do this. You know, so they don't involve them very much. They just tell them what to do. Sometimes, so that's one level of involvement, just giving them orders, telling them. Another, another level of involvement, uh, Instead of trying, instead of telling them to do something, they sell them on that idea. Uh, like, uh, I'm trying to give you an example. All right, so back at Stewart's, we got. They were. Uh, we're start starting to look at one of the farms more on a as a grazing management type deal. And so instead, you know, so the way they approached it was, okay, you know, here's, here's what we're going to do. Here's our goals. And they tried, to, they tried to approach it as a salesman selling the workers on the idea of keeping up the fences and moving the cattle around a lot more. And they just tried to sell them on 
on how much more it's going to be, you know, how much better it's going to be all the way, all the way around. Um, so they didn't really, they didn't check with the workers first. Uh, and I'm not saying they needed to. They just said, okay, this, you know, well, I'm just selling this idea to you. And then tried to get the workers to buy in on it. Does that make sense? I think the buy-ins also includes a good follow-up because a lot of times you're delegating or telling people what to do, and because of peer pressure, they might be agreeing, oh, no problem, I can do that, this and that. And then you get a look, like maybe a deer in the headlights, they don't know what the hell's going on. So uh, always a good thing that we would do is, as managers is follow up. Okay, tell me what I just told you that you're going to do. <laughs> So that would clarify any confusion. That's right. And that's, you know, and this is, you know, coming back to empowering, you know, I told you empowering and delegation involves communication and good interpersonal skills. And that's a prime example of following up, making sure they understand what the goals are and what they're supposed to be doing or the idea that you're, trying to sell them. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, another level of involvement is, is, is checking with the employees, asking them, getting their opinion. You know, when you're out there, you know, and I'd, I'd see this a lot on the farm, you know, you're out there doing the daily, the daily work and, you know, and, you know, Robert would come by and say, hey, Dwayne, you know, we need to do, we need to, say, upgrade the tractor. What do you think, Melton? What do you think, what do you think we ought to get? You know, we need to go bigger, we need to go smaller. I mean, that didn't happen. I'm not, you know with regarding to the, you know, with the tractor, but it was, you know, he would come to me about, a, you know, we, we, we bound, you know, he'd say, okay, well, one time we came, he said, okay, we're looking at, instead of bringing the cattle off the mountain this spring for calving, you know, we're thinking about just letting you calve those cows up there on the mountain. Uh, and it's probably about a thousand, another thousand feet elevation difference between the, the headquarters there at Rich Mountain and up on the mountain. And uh, what's the good points and bad points of it? Because what we did, we brought them in. We brought them down off the mountain, and we used our hay fields to calve them in, and then we'd move them back out as soon as we could off our hay fields. So they were looking at, Keeping all the, you know, going in there and grazing the hay fields, and moving the cattle off and go great, and then go calve them somewhere else, because we had about a two and a half month calving season. They didn't move on the hay field that much, and the only other place we could do it was up there on the mountain in uh, some of those the smaller boundaries up there. And so he, you know, so we discussed the pros and cons of that. And came to the conclusion that it would be safer for everybody involved to bring those cattle off the mountain and use our hay fields for cabin. Because when you get these spring blizzards like this and you have to take a tractor up on the mountain in a bunch of snow hauling hay to those cows and you start sliding and you slide down the mountain, you could be a dead man. Wow. Think about that. And then in regards to the cattle, we had, you know, if something, you know, if it, you know, tonight it's supposed to get 17 degrees without the wind. Okay, so these cattle, you know, they're calving right now. They're wet from the rain. And, uh, you know, so that hair coat's wet, the wind's blowing, it's snowing, 
those cattle are miserable. And those calves are going to be born on cold, wet ground with a really heavy rain or snow, heavy snow or a rain mix type deal coming in on those calves. So they're, they're already wet from the placental fluids. You got that cold, wet precipitation hitting them. They're on cold, wet ground. They don't get some milk in them pretty doggone quick. They're going to chill down and they're going to die. And we had no facilities to stick them in barns to get them dried off, get them sucking, kick them back out. Once they get up, get moving around, get dried off and suck, you know, they'll be all right. But you had to get them past those crucial hours in weather like this. And we didn't have that. Wasn't even any uh, working facilities up there if we had to get a cow in and pull a calf. You know, I just have to rope her and tie her off to a tree and pull the gap. So, uh, so we, you know, we discussed all those pros and cons and, and made the decision. So they checked with me on that. They included me in that decision. So, you know, so you can check with your employees uh, because you know they're there where the rubber meets the road, and they can, they'll, they'll have a lot of suggestions on how to do things better or to avoid problems uh, and including them in the decision. And then sometimes, you know, ideally, you know, if you've got good, capable workers, you want to involve them, help them, you know, get them involved in that decision making. Um, I think they have a lot to offer. So, in order to have your workers involved in decision making and giving them more more responsibilities to do, what are some of those supervisor attributes? What type of supervisors? What are those attributes of those supervisors to involve those workers in there? And I think it goes back. Oh, I think it goes back to the. Your your mentor that you talked about a few classes ago, that he would never ask you to do something that he wouldn't do. Yeah, and I knew he had my back. Yeah. At two in the morning or ten o'clock in the morning, you know, he'd be there. Uh, but I was, you know, going back to what in that situation where Tom and Keith were evaluated on how they trained their people and moved them up the ladder. Uh, you know, they had to have a lot of self-confidence uh, and didn't feel threatened by the workers. They had to have confidence in the, in the workers themselves to be able to train them and throw more responsibility on them and get them moved up the ladder. I think trust would probably be a good word. Yeah. They had to get, have good trust with those workers. And you have to have good leadership skills, right? Yes. You didn't have good leadership skills with Tom and Keith succeeded in those jobs of training people and getting them moved up the company ladder. And plus the the employee they had to want to do well. You couldn't make them to do well. They had to have the desire, the internal drive. Right. Uh, and that's hard to judge on people, isn't it? Very much so. Because you know it you know you thinking back on the these assignments we're doing, you know, and things we're talking about now, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I think if you know, hiring people, you know, if I was in Robert's position 
and having to hire people for that farm. You know, I would want good, capable, smartest people I could get. The best people I could get to come work for me. Uh, because, you know, that's going to make my job easier. I know I can, I can delegate that authority out to them, turn them loose, be there for support, uh, and, and stuff like that. And at the same time, I'd want good, hard, good, hard workers that, that aren't going to complain. People like Marvin, I told you about, you know, you know, he may not be the brightest bulb in the box but boy you know he was trustworthy you could depend on him always told the truth I can deal with that you know I could deal with his flaws for his his really good points so you know I may have a mix because you, you know but I want somebody dependable that I know is going to be there you know, uh, one of those one of those things kind of go back to a few classes ago about the hiring decision I was just sitting reflecting on, on your thoughts then the government has a program uh, with companies if they hire college graduate first year out of college, they get a tax credit. And I had a manager, he set the criteria based upon GPA. And we had a people coming in, people look good on paper, but when they got in to actually do the task in the field, it's like they were all thumbs. And came to realize just because somebody's book smart doesn't mean they're work smart. And we lower the GPA down a little bit and we got a better candidate because most of the students with a less GPA, they had other uh, a attributes. A lot of them had a second job in addition to going to school. And during that time, I think they learned more working on a job as, as they did in the classroom. They, they, they obtained the desire to get ahead because they know what the working world is like. And uh, they pretty much were self-directed and, and motivated. And uh, they actually, um, we got a really good return on investment by, by readjusting our hiring criteria and getting away from the so-called the GPA part, going more to the average student. That's an interesting deal. Uh, I agree with that, big time. Uh, you know, um, because, you know, you know, I take me, for instance, you know, I'm, I work through college. Um, now my boss was a stickler about class and, you know, said, Hey, you got exams coming up, you know, you got finals coming up. I don't want, you know, come in do the feeding and go home and study your number one priority at this stage of your life is school. You know, uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate to work with somebody like that. Uh, but, you know, I was out there every day after class and every Saturday and Sunday working uh, for him. Um, so, you know, it took, you know, so, you know, I had that, I had that other job. Um, and along with stuff I was involved in at college as well. So it was, uh, you know, I stayed pretty busy, didn't, you know, if I dedicated more time to studying, I probably would have had a could probably could have had a higher GPA. But you know, I was working and, and doing extracurricular activities as well, so um, I don't regret it. But you know, trying to you know, we're doing this going through this hiring process, you know, and. You know, looking at resumes, you know, you can make a resume look good. Um, and, you know, people are smart. They'll tell you what you want to hear in an interview, on your interview questions. Um, I had one of the students the other day sent in her, I was grading it over, she sent it in a while ago, but, uh, but I was getting that graded. And, man, you talking about some thought-provoking interview questions? Man, she put them in there to try to figure it out that, you know, it was tell me type stuff. Tell me your experience with this. Tell me what you would do in this situation. 
You know, there were no yes and no questions. It was, tell me this, tell me that. Tell me how you would handle this type of situation. And I, I thought, man, she's put a lot of work in this. Uh, it was really good trying to assess what, you know, that. Go ahead, Keith, you're laughing about something. Oh, no, I just, oh your mic's not on. Just occurred to me when I was at this conference up in Richmond, I ran into a, a, a professor from tech, and I told him what I was doing and mentioned Mr. Scales' name, and he said, oh, yeah, he spoke very highly of, of him and this, and I couldn't remember his name for a second, and it just came to me who he was. Yeah, and we just determined it was Dr. Geyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, that's just scary on multiple levels there. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the worst is it like the bad professor, doesn't he? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if he actually remembers me, that makes me even scarier than anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, he said he did, so I assumed he, he did. But um, and the the professor I, I was you, trying to remember his name was Dr. Jennings that I had. No, I don't remember. Okay, he was there. Yeah, he remembered him. Dr. Geyer is a character. Yeah, he and, was. Yes, he was. And, and such a good teacher, I thought he was. He held yes. your attention. Yes, he did. There was no sleeping in his class. No, if he did, he threw an eraser at you. Did you ever see him do that? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, he <laughs> nailed the person who was sitting in front of me one day, but at least it wasn't me. <laughs> he no, might have been aiming for me, but... <laughs> Just since you're talking about throwing a racer, I relate a story. When I was a student, a grad student, we had a visiting professor from Saudi Arabia. And um, the student put his foot, the sole of his foot, facing to the professor on the, on the chair in front of him. And the teacher went ballistic, almost threw the kid out of the classroom. and couldn't understand what was going on. And this poor student was going on. But that's the ultimate insult in the Middle East country to show the sole of your foot to, to someone. It's like, I guess, giving them the finger. And uh, the teacher just, you know, just went off on them. I had this one. Did you ever have Dr. Green, Tom? Was he there when you were there? That's uh, the horse guy? No, he was an animal science professor. Yeah, I, I had him as a teacher. I did. I've yeah, tried real, he, yeah. He was pretty old when I got there. Yeah, he he was there, but I didn't have a class with him. I think he retired pretty quick after I got there. But yeah, teach him, I think, was, was the whole. I had, yeah, I had, I had animal Beecham. science or animal, teach him was, you know, animal yeah. science with him. Yeah. But uh, Keith, if you remember, if you never wore a hat in his class, you yeah. always took it off. If not, he, he wore took one it though. Off for you. Yeah, that's right. What's that? He wore a big hat. He did, but yeah. he never had it on no. in the classroom. He always took it off when he came in the classroom, and he expected yeah. everybody else to remove their hats or caps um, he, in the classroom. His attribute that I can remember him, I made a comment one time in class that I could not stand lamb. So the worst stuff I ever had in my, li in my life. Uh -oh. And I got, a call, I got a call from one time and went over his house and had lamb dinner. It was the best lamb I've ever had in my life. And he told me most people don't have to prepare lamb. You have to remove the connective tissue off of it before you cook it, and most people don't do that. Huh. And Dr. Green loved sheep. He was a sheep guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and Dr. Beecham was the horse guy. Meacham. Yeah, Meacham. Meacham. I like Meacham. Dr. He, Meacham. I tell you, old Meacham, my opinion, if I could describe Meacham, he was an overeducated cowboy. Yeah. Yeah, he looked like he cowboy too. He had that too. cowboy attitude. Yep. Uh, with about everything he pursued or he went yep. after. Yep. And, uh, and he had to, had the height for the basketball team though. Boy, he was big old tall lanky guy. Had that cowboy attitude. But if, you know. Did and I'm did not you take the bad, but Did I'm you take the food right. nutrition class? Um, I can't think of professor's name right now. Dr. Kelly. Yeah, and he passed around uh, 
oh gosh, the vial of something, wanted anybody to, to smell it was okay, but he had dipped the vial in something, your hands smell like Limburg cheese for the rest of the day. God, if people, you go to the next class, they say, what is that? <laughs> you know, I can't remember, yeah. Was that, was that Dr. Kelly? I can't remember. I read science. Yeah, it was in the building next door to the animal science building, the, the biochemistry, uh, food nutrition. Oh, I didn't have that. No. Was I was that Smythe, over, Smythe I was Hall or Smythe Hall? No, no I didn't have him. Over near yeah, okay, around that way there. Yeah. But, yeah, I think it's just a but, uh, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Meacham, I really liked him. He was a good guy. I loved, I loved his attitude. He just very practical. Uh, he called it the way it was, whether you wanted to hear it or not. He just down to earth, but he, and, like and it did, and it didn't matter if his students knew nothing about a horse. He still would work with them, work with you, and yeah. just friendly. I mean, he was a great guy. I, I, he was one of my favorite professors there. Yeah, I think the hardest class I had, I took as elective, and I, I here I am as a science major, not an animal science person, never been a farm in my life. I took stock judging. And that was probably the hardest class, going out trying to judge something. You didn't even know the head from the tail. <laughs> now, when you took that, who taught that? Was that Dr. That was Dr. Green. Green. Was that ever saw, or was it, it was Dr. Green. Dr. Dr. Green. Green. Okay. Yeah. That, that was a hard class. I didn't know Dr. Green did the livestock judging. Yeah. So, guys, we're out of time. Uh, I know we got sidetracked a lot today and was telling stories and real-life situations. Uh, now, when's I, our test going to be? Uh, I don't have it up yet. I was just going to put it on Blackboard and let you all take it at your convenience. So I'm trying to plan. It's like this week, next week? or I, I, I've I'll got... get it on Blackboard today. Okay, because I've got to, I've got to be at a conference next week, and I don't know exact dates. I've got to be there yet i'll find out well that's by fine. the end of the week okay gotcha. it'll be the same you can just take it like at a testing center or something okay okay the, uh, okay so you, you put up today that, that'll be good so that'll give me time this week also um the metrics for our, our last two assignments unless i m missed them i didn't see them on blackboard for okay the which one the the last two the metrics for the uh offer and rejection letter and then the final offer letter I didn't see those. Okay. I'll, let me pull it up. Uh, Unless I... It, I the grading criteria. Yeah. Uh, I got it. That's for the compensation assignment. I did that. First okay. One, second one's a hiring grade cover sheet. Got that. Uh, but it's on here. I did not go far enough down or what? Yeah, I don't think you went far enough down because it's only like a few Because the last one I had was the, the compensation assignment. That was as far as the metrics went. The compensation assignment's on a different one. Yeah, I know, but that's it's, the last it's one. It's on the same one with the uh, with the job description. Hiring Can decision. Can you see that on the, on the yeah, board? Yeah, I got, I, got, I got all that, but I didn't see that in there. All right, just keep on scrolling down. Oh, okay. Maybe I didn't go to the end. Here's your offer letter. For some reason, those last two pages didn't print off. Okay. So you have date, firm's name. Yeah, I go here. Your, I go. You know, name of your firm, title of the position you're, they're hiring, you're hiring, uh, your salary, the pay period. This leave policy, uh, that's going to be, you know, sick leave or vacation leave. Uh, that's not, you know, if you leave me, give me two weeks' notice. Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I've had that before with the leave policy. Leave policy, give me two weeks' notice before you quit. Uh, leave policy is, you know, if you're sick, you know, you have X number of sick days, paid sick days, or paid vacation days, or X number of holidays. If that's offered, if not, you can say, you know, there's no paid leave. You don't show up, you don't get paid. Uh, benefits. 
list of benefits offered or say there's no benefits. Okay. okay. Make sure you I bet have you my, a date we need to respond by. I bet you my printer went out of paper and why I didn't print off the last two pages. I didn't realize it did that. Okay. okay. Not a problem. On this rejection, do not give them a reason why they were not hired. Don't ever do that. Just say, uh, we, we, you know, thank you for your interest in our, our job and interviewing. And, but, you know, we made, we, we hired the person we feel is the most suitable for this position. Do not give them a reason. And thank them for their interest. Uh, now, now how, how would you handle this question? Say, say that you sent that letter out and the person respond to them and, and they came back and say, well, I really like to pursue this uh, maybe with another company. I think this kind of job is what I want. What criteria, what comments do you have that would improve my performance uh, in a future evaluation or interview? Uh, you know, you'd probably want to be pretty general with that. Because you don't want to open up yourself for liability. Yeah. Uh, you know, and depending what the situation is, you could say, you know, you were a really strong candidate if they were. It's just that we had another candidate that was just as strong or stronger that we just felt would be better suited for our, for our company. Or you could say, you know, you know, you had a lot of good qualities, uh, some things you were weak on, you know, you need